Uh, everyone, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, Venny is um, someone who has a, a, a great deal of personal responsibility for uh, building the internet in Bulgaria, uh, and then sort of from there, uh, a lot of responsibility for the shape of the internet uh, in states that were uh, in the former Soviet Union and, and satellite states. So he's uh, one of the leading experts on internet policy and governance worldwide, with a particular uh, focus on uh, Russia, CIS, Eastern Europe. Um, he is not exactly new uh, to this game. Uh, Venny, in 1990, uh, founded one of the first uh, FidoNet nodes in Bulgaria, the first, I think, uh, and went on to, to fund the, found the second ISP uh, in the country. Uh, and from very, very early on, has sort of taken a great deal of involvement and responsibility um, for the really complicated internet governance issues that I think almost everyone in this room understands are incredibly important, but a lot of us end up uh, totally intimidated and sort of withdrawn from. Um, so I always look forward to having Venny around uh, as sort of a reminder of, of what's so critical with these issues and what we should be looking at and paying attention to. Um, he is the, uh, the Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement for Russia, CIS, and Eastern Europe for ICANN. He's a former ICANN board member, uh, former board member of Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, uh, the Internet Society, more or less, if it affects the governance of the global Internet, he's been involved with it at quite senior levels over the last 20-plus years. And so uh, we were trading some email a couple of months ago, and I was very interested in this question of what does Internet governance look like post Snowden. And Venny, in, in his inevitable way, has sort of come back and said, that's the wrong question, uh, that, that there are massive, massive changes happening in governance, and, and Snowden may be the reason that I'm paying attention to it, um, but it isn't really where these changes are coming from. And so with that provocation, uh, I wanted to uh, hand it over to our friend and, and uh, get an update. We're thrilled to have you here at the Berkman Center. Thank you, Ethan. I hope that my microphone is working so that people, yes, I see that... Uh... Uh, it's working for recording, but uh, it never hurts to be loud. Uh, no, but so the, the, pr pr project. The, 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 I was going to make a joke that anyway, some microphone somewhere is working. So, <laughs> 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 but then I don't know the sense of humor I read today in the Wall Street no, Journal. No, you should I, not that, make jokes because you never that, know. That'll work well. Uh, the the. You're right. I mean, the the and and by the way, I'm going to use a lot of abbreviations. And if you don't, somebody doesn't know what an an abbreviation means, just raise your hand, and I'll immediately try to remember what it meant. <laughs> uh, but um, the 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 whole debate, and we were talking with Susan Crawford, with whom we served on the ICANN board together a few years ago, like six, seven years ago, that uh, these good old times when nobody really cared about ICANN are gone. Uh, and ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, the domain name and IP address uh, body. Uh, and we kind of felt back then that we are, we are in this little box, which is, you know, dealing with domain names. There was nothing on the horizon like big changes in the industry. There were talks about new generic top-level domains or GTODs. There were talks about introducing internationalized domain names. These are domain names that are written in different scripts than English. And, uh, but that was still a work in progress. And really, nobody knew what ICANN is. And today, for uh, the reasons that you mentioned in our email communication, people suddenly are talking about ICANN in the context of uh, revelations or whatever you call them. Um, now, and there are many myths around this. And one of the first myths is that um, ICANN is part of this conversation because of the revelations. The reality is that um, the, uh, the, the ICANN is used because ICANN is the, the kind of the only body that exists as a, as a legal entity somewhere. And um, I cannot not remember my, one of my first speeches in Russia when I went there, maybe even still as a board member. And um, I was talking to people and I said, guys, you know, just think for a moment if the Internet was not created in 
the US by Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, the people who wrote the TCPIP protocol. What if it was created in the Soviet Ministry of Defense in like 1969? Would they ever give this to the Ministry of Commerce? And would the Department of Commerce ever give the control over this domain name system to a non-profit based in Vladivostok? Because if you think about California, it's as far from Washington as Vladivostok is from Moscow. And, you know, people started laughing, but one guy completely seriously raised his hand and said, Venny, you don't know how uh, uh, right you are. The Internet was created in the Soviet Union two years before Vint and Bob Kahn created their protocol. And the two people who created it, they're still working at the Soviet, I mean, at the Russian Ministry of Defense, <laughs> and they're using it. <laughs> so it's, we, of course, it was a joke, but it looked really serious, and people for a moment thought, oh, maybe it's two. So we kind of tend to forget that how the history started. And we forget it because it's, it's kind of not on our radars. You know, what happened 40 years ago, who cares? But there is another example. What if the internet was created in China? What if we had to write our domain names today in Chinese? I could probably remember one uh, domain name in Chinese, which will be my, like, whatever the google.com would be, you know, the search engine. And for many people around the globe, the internet, uh, who don't understand the Latin script, the internet was, uh, until recently, this kind of, you know, Latin Western something. Now, things have changed since then. And things have changed uh, in many different ways. One of them is we introduced domain names in uh, different scripts than Latin. There are Arabic, Chinese, Cyrillic, you name it. Uh, even Serbian, since you're from Serbia here. Um, but, uh, but that also um, exposed ICANN to a, a bigger scrutiny. And that's not bad. That's actually very healthy for ICANN. We, way back, uh, we were kind of asking governments, please join ICANN, join the Governmental Advisory Committee. We beg you. Because <laughs> there were like 30 or maybe 40 governments that would uh, participate in ICANN. Now there are more than 130. And we are still asking other governments who are not members to join and contribute in the dialogue about how the Internet is going to be shaped. Uh, but, um, but in this work that ICANN does, um, there are people who are constantly unhappy. And the interesting thing is there are different people. So we used to say back in the board times that uh, whatever decision ICANN takes, half of the people will always be unhappy. And it doesn't matter what the decision is. If you introduce a new top-level domain, half of the people will be unhappy. If you don't introduce it, another half will be unhappy. So it's really like, uh, that reminds me of uh, Aristotle who said once that the only way to avoid criticism is say nothing, do nothing, or be nothing. And it's, it's in a way what I can is not. And it's in a way also the fact that suddenly governments realized and people realized that the Internet is not only, you know, sending emails and browsing Facebook or whatever Facebook in local language exists, uh, but it's also um, about privacy and um, control over the content that you publish. And, um, of course, um, I don't know if you know that, by the way. Do you know who is, which is the fastest reading English nation on the planet? Any guesses? It's fastest not the U.S. Reading? Reading in English. Just which nation on the planet is fast, fastest reading English? It's not England. It's none of the English-speaking countries. Singapore. No. India. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually Serbia. Huh. Because it takes 0 0.2 seconds between opening the um, rules and terms of using Facebook <laughs> and clicking on the OK. <laughs> and you know, it's like 20 pages document, so. It takes really quick reading. <laughs> now, I could have sent some other country, obviously, but since my fellow Balkan uh, uh, lady here is from a neighboring country, I'm from Bulgaria originally, so I can use that one. But uh, but the this all this all this this dialogue around you know what's happening on the internet and what is this internet governance is fascinating because for many countries. 
uh, the term governance doesn't exist in their own language. Like in Bulgarian or in other languages, you cannot say governance because people tend to think of governance as something that the government does. So they don't understand governance as a place where citizens, companies, non-profits, governments get together, which I can is on an equal platform, as we used to say. It, there is another term, which, by the way, is untranslatable, and this is multi-stakeholder model, or, mul or equal multi-stakeholder, or multi-equal stakeholder model, which is what ICANN is. So uh, many people are confused. When we start to explain how ICANN works, how the internet works, they say, well, but who controls it? A few years ago, six, seven years ago, and I've seen only one journalist piece, by the way, only one, which actually does not ask, they, they write, a, they wrote, a, it's a Russian journalist, he wrote a big uh, story in, in a magazine called Computera, and he said, well, the right question actually is not who controls the internet, but what controls the internet, and he claims that it's not people, it's not organizations, it's actually the standards that are the ones that control how the internet works. And if you, if there are, there, I didn't hear that many engineers here, but you may agree with that. Uh, even though the lawyers among us will probably say, no, 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 it's the laws, you know, but they, they, they control it. But, um, but the dialogue, the, the dialogue that we are trying to, uh, we've been building, not trying, I mean, we've, we've tried for quite a while and now it seems like it's taking the momentum. And I think Snowden was probably the catalyst of all this because, not because of what he said, and I mean, I couldn't care less about the problems that the NSA is facing and stuff like that, but now suddenly the government, the governments and the individuals around the world, they say, well, let's look at the architecture of the internet, let's look at the way it's being built, why is there only one uh, domain name system, why are there not many? And this dialogue is healthy for the internet itself. And my goal actually was not only for the people here, but for the people who are on the web and will be watching this, uh, reading the blogs, that they start to be interested in this and they say, well, maybe we should go and participate in this ICANN thing. Let's see what it is. Uh, we have found throughout the years, and especially in the last couple of years, not, not related to what you mentioned in the beginning, uh, Ethan, but uh, that people from places which are not very active otherwise, they somehow become um, very engaged in uh, the development of the Internet. And even small countries understand that actually they could make a difference if they join the dialogue, if they contribute with their know-how. And in, in many cases, it's it's actually the people who are with, who are thinking outside of the box, people who are not the usual participants and at, at these meetings that come with some new ideas or new proposals or suggestions. And um, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year, there was a, a lady from a Bulgarian university who came to an ICANN meeting as an ICANN fellow. We have this program where we help people from developing countries and countries in transition. Uh, by, um, it's a public program, so you can, anyone can go even today on the ICANN.org website and apply if uh, he or she is from such a country for a fellow, uh, for, for a fellowship and come to the next meeting in London in June. And um, she came, she was looking around, she, she looked very lost, basically, because an ICANN meeting is about, it was the one in Beijing, actually, there were like 3,000 people in the middle of China, uh, I have no idea, you know, right now 1.5 billion people or whatever. And she seemed close, but then she came again. And then, this was in last summer, and then two months later, she sent me a, an email saying, well, what do you think, can, can we start in our university a course in internet governance and cybersecurity? And I said, sure, why not? I mean, who am I to say no? And then a couple of weeks later, she came with a description of the course, an invitation for me to be a lecturer and to bring other lecturers. So little did I know when I said sure, you know, that <laughs> we'll end up talking to like 30 students who were masters uh, in their master's program on internet governance. And now 
this month in February, I'm supposed to receive 30 essays, which means I'm going to spend extra hours, you know, reading essays and giving them grades because they get credits for that. So they actually are engaged. So I think this is the beauty of the multi-stakeholder model. This is the beauty of um, what we are doing. I also, by the way, <coughs> if you feel free to jump in with a question, if you have a question, because uh, by the, the end of this, you may have forgotten what your question was. And I especially ask Susan Crawford, who I know she's leaving at 1 o'clock, so if you have a question about ICANN in particular, let me know. But, um, but um, we, we, also, we also have um, another thing which is related to the Internet governance. I mean, you see this table in the back, and uh, Daniel can send it later, because this is publicly accessible information, so anyone who wants to get it, uh, or you can put it on the website probably for download. And this is all Creative Commons, so credit to, to the people who build it are written on the, on the files. Um, the dialogue now is so intense that as we speak now here, around the world there are probably dozens of places where people like us are sitting and talking about the way the Internet should be governed. And it's not that they don't like the current system, it's some people don't like it, some people want to improve it, some people think they should replace it. My favorite one about the replacement is um, on the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union uh, website. Uh, it's a password protected website, so you cannot download this document, but you can see the title. And the title is, and you can Google Syria, Saudi Arabia, Internet Innovative Technologies and you will find this document. It's amazing, because you, suddenly you see two countries which, if you read the newspapers, don't really talk to each other, Syria and Saudi Arabia. They propose a common joint document to the ITU to create a new internet based on uh, an alternative internet based on innovative technologies. I've been at the ITU on the Bulgarian governmental delegation when we were discussing this document, and it was fascinating because um, uh, what they say is right. They say, well, the current internet has too much spam. Uh, it's not secure. We need to build a new internet, which is more secure, has no spam, and the governments can build it. But it's right when you listen to it, if you kind of say, okay, there is nothing like that existing, so let's build something uh, from scratch. But the internet exists. And we actually spent two hours describing, <coughs> discussing whether it should be new internet with a small i, of new internet with a capital I, until the British guy came in and said, well, BBC has always used small i. So that really doesn't, <laughs> it's, not a, <laughs> it's not a big issue. <laughs> so, so in this, in this, um, in this ecosystem of internet governance, there are many organizations. I, I talked about ICANN. There is the Internet Society, which Ethan mentioned. There is the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. And there is the organization which almost nobody knows about, except uh, 1,500, 2,000 engineers and all the people who actually work with the standards on the Internet, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the IETF. This is the group of engineers who are creating the standards. They're even not called standards. They're called Requests for Comments, RFCs, uh, which run the Internet. I mean, the story about creating the RFCs is fascinating. If you haven't read it, take a look. I mean, it's written on the Wikipedia. Take a look at people like Steve Crocker, who is currently chairman of the ICANN board, and how they came out with the idea about not setting standards, but RFCs. Uh, sometimes, I mean, I'm a lawyer by education, but sometimes I really appreciate the engineers. Even though I know that they always think they're better than the lawyers, but, you know, so, certain things they did much better than a lawyer would have done, especially way back in the beginning of the Internet. So, uh, there are, and there, then there are, also, um, there are also international organizations like the ITU, which is an international treaty organization. So, governments are members. And they're the ones who actually can take decisions. And in, in this uh, lit little table here, and this one shows the meetings last year in 2013, but there are meetings also, if you go down the slide, you will see the meetings for 2014. There are a number of meetings that are taking place this year, which have the potential to shape the future of the Internet. Uh, ICANN has three meetings every year. 
usually in the fall, the summer, and the spring. Uh, the ISOG board meets regularly. The ITF meets regularly. I mean, every actually every organization that's on the internet is meeting regularly, usually in public meetings. So anyone can go, or some of those are webcast. The ICANN meetings, are, most of them are webcast. In some of our meetings, people can actually participate remotely and ask questions and get answers to their questions. So you don't need to travel. You, you may still need to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning to be able to participate, depending <coughs> on like ne the next meeting in March is in Singapore. So clearly, for the US audience, it will be not very uh, easy to participate. But, um, but in those meetings, we try to hear everyone who has something to say. And you know, in some cases, this may be people who have come for the first time. They go to the microphone and they speak to the ICANN board, which is a, an international board. And I'm not going to go into the details here, like why I believe that ICANN is an international organization, while it's not legally international treaty organization. But um, you, can, you can find your a, a fellow countryman no matter where you are coming from, at an ICANN meeting. There are people from east and west, south and north, and they're really, in, in, it's, it's really exciting to see those people talking to like the fathers of, and mothers of the internet and thinking, well, you know, maybe this is the next, like this 20-year kid is the next uh, uh, Vin Cerf or it's the next uh, I don't know, Larry Page or Sergey Brin. Uh, or maybe, who knows, you know, in, in five years or ten years, what would exist? Like, Facebook just celebrated ten years today or yesterday, right? So we, nobody knew what it is ten years ago. Ten years and one day ago, probably a handful of people knew what it is. Uh, Twitter didn't exist at all. Uh, not even blogging, if you think about it. Well, kind of, but it wasn't called blogging, I guess. You were just writing stuff. Uh, so, the in this dialogue, I'm really encouraged to see also um, in that the governments, no matter how l little they were interested in what ICANN was doing just a few years ago, are now interested, even though not necessarily understanding how the internet works. This is the role where the educational institutions are very helpful. And we have, we, we reached out, we work, and we reached out, and we're developing relationships with different academic institutions around the world. I just mentioned Bulgaria, where we're doing some outreach, but there are many other countries where ICANN is uh, involved uh, with academic institutions. Because if we don't educate the people who are the decision makers, if we don't educate the people who work at, like, national parliaments or, um, or other regulatory bodies, we cannot expect them to understand what is at stake and how the internet works. And believe me, uh, some people don't understand how the internet works. And I'm not saying, don't, I'm not telling you trust me on that, I'll give you an example. Uh, and I'll, I'll <coughs> save the name of the organization so that it doesn't look like uh, I'm revealing some, or making some people feeling unhappy, but they'll, in a big organization, um, they wanted to get engaged somehow in this internet thing. And they said, well, we want to deliver, we want to be responsible to give out IP addresses. Like, uh, currently the model is that the regional internet registries, these are five regions, you know, the five continents, more or less, give IP addresses to whoever wants it. Usually these are internet service providers or big institutions. And they said, well, maybe we can get one trillion IP addresses from the new version 6, uh, and we'll distribute them among um, people and organizations who want to have IP addresses. And they were very committed to get those one trillion IP addresses, except they didn't know they cannot get them. They even had an expert on IPv6 who would give them advice, and, I'm, and I should have put it quotes around expert. And they didn't know that they cannot get them because one trillion IP addresses, even though it sounds like a big number, 
in the version 6 of the IP addresses, it's not possible to get it because the smallest segment you can get consists of 18 million blocks. Each of them is 1 trillion IP addresses. So in other words, you really cannot get 1 trillion IP addresses to give away. <laughs> you can get 18 million <coughs> blocks and each of them has 1 trillion IP addresses. Now, people are kind of confused with the big numbers because um, currently we, we use, an, I mean, in the majority of the services and probably including here, uh, we are using um, a version of the IP uh, which is called version 4. I'm just trying to see whether... Yeah, I'm on version 4 connected. But I see also that you guys have IPv6 in the, in the network here. So if your device supports IPv6, you can get an IPv6 address. If it doesn't, you still get connected to the IPv4. And the IPv4 are 4 point something billion addresses, so there are not that many. And when these organizations said we, we need one trillion addresses, to them they looked a big number. So we, we need to educate people. We need to, and, and the problem is also that there are not that many people that can go and educate other people or train the trainers, as we say. Um, so we want to, and, and through our work as in the regions, like I, I'm responsible for Russia, Eastern Europe, but through our, our, there are other vice presidents responsible for other regions. We also try to bring our knowledge to the regions, but also bring the, the, the interesting knowledge from the regions to ICANN. And one of the, one of the most challenging things is that often people would say, well, but you are from ICANN, of course you will say this. <laughs> and if you think about it, yes, it has some sense, right? I mean, if we are talking about keeping the... Um, multi-stakeholder, multi uh, even I was going to make a, an error now saying multilateral, which is a different word. The multi-stakeholder model, they say, yeah, you want to support this model because this is serving ICANN and you're a self-serving organization and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, some of the old uh, gurus of the internet and the evangelists uh, like Vincer, they say, well, they, they use this term, if, if it ain't broken, uh, don't fix it, right? That's the English. Sure. Well, in, in Russia, we, they say, and in Eastern Europe, we say, if it's working, don't touch it. It's a little bit different concept. Because we know that if we touch it, if it's going to stop working. <laughs> uh, because everything worked in our system by magic, you know. <laughs> and, and I've lived 21 years under... Uh, um, and that's why I was laughing, by the way. This is completely off topic, but... That's why I was laughing when Snowden came last month, I mean last year, and started saying this big shit. I was like, ah, okay, whatever, I lived 21 years in a state which was wiretapping everyone. We knew it. So what's the big deal? But, uh, but um, the, the, the reality is that the internet is working and it has a lot of glitches, but there are a lot of people engaged in making it better. Uh, at this point, we... I don't. I haven't seen uh, anyone who has come with a proposal really except this one at the ITU uh, about building a new internet uh, based on whatever technologies, innovative, alternative, and and it's not a coincidence. It's not by accident that there is not. Uh, the, the the reality is that not only that it's working, it has allowed people around the globe, and that I think is the ultimate benefit of the internet. It has allowed people from around the world to exchange ideas, views, and information, which otherwise they would have never been able to. And you said 20 plus years. I still remember, actually, it was September 3rd, 1990, when I sat in front of the... I, I was sitting in front of this brand new 386 machine, 25 megahertz with 120 megabytes hard drive and the enormous 4 megabyte of RAM and it was connected with a 1200 BPS modem to the internet. Now, such speeds don't exist today. I mean, such low speeds. And I was understanding I can sit in the middle of nowhere in Bulgaria, like a country which has just ended communism a few months earlier, and be part of the world. <coughs> and share views and, and ideas and gain experience from around the world. Now, today, it's even, it's obviously much easier and it's much faster, except for the U.S. 
where the internet is still slow and expensive. <laughs> That's another topic. <laughs> Susan is laughing because she remembers probably a few years ago there was a study of the, uh, was it the FTC, I think? There was an internet task force group, something like that. And they came to the conclusion that the internet in the U.S. is, uh, I was actually interviewed by them because I have just moved to the U.S. and I was shocked in New York City to find out that you only have two internet service providers for 10 million people population. In Bulgaria, we have 2,000 for 7 million people. And we pay $15 a month for one gigabit connection. And I was like, really? This is the U.S.? <laughs> the creme de la creme of the internet? The... Anyway. So, so going back to, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping on and off, but I, I, I'll spend another probably four minutes talking, and I, then I hope we can start into sure, a we'll Q&A session. Yeah. Going back to these meetings and why are, they report, why are they important? And each of them is important. Whether we are talking about the coming ITU plenipotentiary meeting at the end of the year when there will be elections and new secretary general will be elected, but also the ITU may decide to change its constitution to include dealing not only with telecommunications but with internet related issues. Or we are talking about the Internet Governance Forum which is a, a meeting that takes place every year, and this year it's going to be in September in Istanbul, and where about 1,500 people from all over uh, meet and talk about like a huge variety of topics, from legal framework to promote the Internet to legal framework to uh, not promote the Internet. I mean, you may, or, or technical aspects, or, or political, or cultural, or you go to, to ICANN meetings, so you go to another meeting which is taking place in April in Dubai, the World Telecommunications Development Conference, where organizations, I mean, uh, governments and, and companies will meet together to talk uh, on a topic called broadband for sustainable development. Now, the term broadband has different meaning in different countries. In some countries, it's... Uh, it's, an, it's a telephone connection or ADSL connection. In some countries, they use mobile connectivity. Uh, in countries like Bulgaria, I said, it's like the digital divide is between the people who are connected at one gigabit and the people who are connected at 100 megabits. And in other countries, it's whether you are at all connected. And institutions like the European Commissions are allocating hundreds of, or even billions of dollars of euros every year to kind of bring the internet to the people because they understand. And in Africa, they don't even have the money to bring the, p the internet to the people. But everybody understands that it's important to be connected. And it's important also because currently only about 2.5 billion people are connected. So another 5 billion are not connected. And they are not connected, which means they don't know what they can gain from the world. But we also don't know what they can bring to the world. So in this global dialogue, in this global discussion about how the internet works, ICANN has basically one goal, which is that when you type your domain name somewhere, when you connect to the internet, you will be connected to this united internet around the world. And when you put down whatever domain name you put down, you will actually go to that website. Now, I, c I can go into details about the security and stability of the internet, although I don't think that that's interesting for some of the lawyers, at least. But also, it's important to know that um, every once in a while, um, there are young, or not so young, but anyway, there are bright people who come with a, with a discovery, like a few years ago, uh, uh, a guy who was young back, back then, Kaminsky came with an idea that the domain name system actually can be tricked into, into not working quite well. And the c technical community got together and came with, a, with an extension, a security extension of the domain name system, so that now you, it's, and it's implemented more and more widely around the world, so that you will be sure that the, when you write um, Google.com, you will actually go to Google.com and not to somebody who pretends it's Google.com and collect your data. So, and this is only part of what we do. And, now, and another part of what we do is just to give you an idea 
of how you can get engaged and people can get engaged. Um, a few years ago, there was a, there was a computer virus which was supposed to s start operating at a certain date, and it was called Configure. And it was supposed to start working on that particular date all around the country called top level domains. So then organizations from around the world, ICANN including, got together and started working on a protocol which would eliminate or, or, or at least lower the damage from this virus, and it worked. People probably even didn't notice that there was something like that. Now, we don't deal with other issues which kind of make the headlines, like stealing 50 or 70 million accounts from Target, which, if you think about the name of the shop, it's really a Target. <laughs> But what happened there, actually, what made the headlines and what makes the headlines around the world is bringing the people closer to the understanding why the Internet is important. What is this thing that drives the Internet? And I'll, I'll finish with a, another recollection of my personal history. In 1999, um, the Bulgarian government introduced licensing to the Internet service providers. And they said that this is good for the users. And we, the Internet Society, of which I was the chair, we challenged that in the Supreme Court of Bulgaria. Nobody wanted to be our lawyer. They said, you're going to lose the case. This is the first case against the government. Forget it. So I, with my fragile legal background, I said, OK, the worst thing that can happen is for me to be my own lawyer. So we started the case. Ten months later, at the last... Um, um, session of the court, when it was already clear that we are winning, uh, we had like a line of waiting lawyers outside of our office. Everybody wanted to be our lawyer. Uh, we reached out of court agreement with the uh, Prime Minister of Bulgaria, and they got rid of the licenses. But what, what it helped, actually, in these 10 months, there were more than 300 publications in the Bulgarian media about the case and about the Internet. The result was staggering, like suddenly people started to realize there is something called the internet and there is a case and the government is against, or is trying to control it, so probably it's not that bad, you know, usually the East European mentality is if the government wants to get control over something, then, you know, you have to react. And it's based, again, I mean, we've lived for 45 years under a communist system which was trying to kind of oppress everything, so our reaction was instinctively to fight with it. Uh, and it's my own understanding is that if we don't communicate, if we don't talk to each other, if we don't engage, things are only going to get worse. Now, in a dialogue, especially online, it's very difficult to, and we had a, a, earlier before we started this conversation, a, a dialogue here with Ax uh, about... Uh, the fact that if you enter a conversation with an opinion already, it's very difficult to change it. Uh, try it. Try it somewhere online, especially. <laughs> Engage in a conversation with somebody who already has an opinion. I gave the example if, uh, if you're talking about the browsers, and somebody enters the conversation with the opinion that a browser is better than, a diff than another browser. It's impossible to change his or her opinion. But if somebody enters a conversation asking a question, say, hey, which browser is better, you know, A, B, or C, then you can actually start answering questions, and depending on the person's requirements, he may say, oh, okay, so for, uh, let's say, on my iPhone or on my whatever smartphone, if I'm watching, if I'm using Gmail, Chrome may be better, but if I'm doing something else, Opera may be better, or Safari may be better. So in other words, then you can form an opinion. But I, I think we should not be afraid by entering conversation with people who already have an opinion, because otherwise, you know, you may sit down and say, well, my opinion is this, and your opponent or your partner says my opinion is that, and then you never reach an agreement. But if we don't talk about those issues, if we don't talk about the way the Internet is working and the way the Internet is governed, and we don't try to participate in all these meetings, 
And when I say we, I don't mean me, you, or anyone should go to every and each of those meetings. It's impossible, I, I'm telling you. I tried it a couple of years ago. That's not possible. Like, you cannot fly <coughs> in Brazil and then for two days and then fly out to Geneva because the meetings are taking place at the same time. And mentioning Brazil, and that's the... Oh, I, I missed my time. But anyway, mentioning Brazil, that's one of the hot topics now. Uh, there, is a, there is a meeting coming in Brazil at the end of April, which was um, introduced initially by the ICANN president, Fadi Shekhadi, and the Brazilian president, Dilma Rousseff, who, her father was Bulgarian, just to claim some credit for that. Uh, not because her father was Bulgarian, but actually because if she was born in Bulgaria, she would have never become president of Brasilia, so she was really happy to be born in Brazil. Uh, but um, this meeting in Brazil is actually going to be a very important one, talking about the different importance of meeting, because it's the first time when governments at such high level actually engage with the non governmental sector and said, you guys, let's sit down and talk about these issues. Let's see what we can agree on. Maybe let's see what we can disagree on. But it's still a dialogue. So it's, that's why I believe it's very important. There, are, um, there is a website, and I will give it later the links so that they can be published on the web uh, page where, of the Berkman Center so people can go and take a look. So let me First, thank you. And, and <clears throat> let me take maybe the right of the first question to maybe put a bit of a, a pointed question to you, which is the point you've been making throughout is that you want more people involved with Internet governance. At the same time, you, you've been making the point, whether directly or indirectly, that it's a vast field, a huge number of organizations. You have to spend a lot of time on airplanes and not all of these meetings are actually open to you. They're often open to engineers. They're often open to, to different groups of people. So here's the question. What do you want people to do? First, for ordinary people who are going to see a link to Nathan's coverage of this on Reddit today and are a 25-year-old recent university graduate, what should that person who cares about the Internet do? And second, what should I, as someone who's on the board of directors of a major international foundation that might get very involved with internet governance, but so far has very consciously chosen not to get involved with international governance, what would you want us to do? Okay, so there are actually very similar um, things that each of us can do. First of all, you don't need to travel, I said already, you can participate remotely, but secondly, there are mailing lists. And now I know that there are annoying people on every mailing list, or internet trolls, or you name it. But um, it's very easy to filter those. And in a dialogue on a mailing list, like for example, right now there is a huge dialogue going on a mailing list at onenet.org, one with a number. And uh, it's good to be part of this dialogue because these are people with 20 plus year knowledge who are talking between each other, talking to everyone on the list, and in this conversation, you not only have history of how the Internet was developed, but you also have some visions about what the Internet could be. And the, the, really, the dialogue is what the Internet could be, not this year, not in two years, but let's say in ten years. Now, if you have talked to someone ten years ago and you have said, well, my, you know, I think the Internet would be a huge website where everyone will be sharing pictures and statuses and explaining what they're doing and uh, using 140 characters to say something substantive, people would have probably laughed and said, no way, you know, you need to sit down and write a blog or you need to send a huge email to a, to a mailing list. That's the only way to do it. Now, um, the, however, and that's uh, one thing which we have to be all aware of, um, there are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't name countries because I'm not a president of a country. Although I can point to a speech by the Estonian president, and Estonia is a country which is always given as an example, at least in the European Union, as sometimes they joke as E-Estonia because it's so modern and advanced and using technologies. They vote, by the way, for the last more than 10 years, they vote online. 
And when the elections in the U.S. were taking place a few years ago when, you know, they were counting the votes in Florida and George Bush became president, nobody knows how and what were the exact number of the vote, people were laughing, you know, because you can just vote online, put your digital signature and the results come immediately. So the president of Estonia has a speech on June 8, 2012, uh, and it's on president.ee, you can find it in the archives. Well, he talks about the future of the Internet with regards to the coming, back then, conference in Dubai, which took place in December 2012. There are many places around the world where uh, not everyone can participate. You're right. Uh, the ITU conferences are uh, one of those places, like the ITU Plenipotentiary Conference, only government de governmental delegations, and so-called sector members. These are companies that pay a huge amount of money to be part of the ITU, but even they cannot speak unless they are asked to. So uh, in, in our ecosystem, in the ICANN world, everyone can speak on equal footing. Like whether you are Joe the plumber or the president of a country, you all can go to the same microphone and you all can speak to the board in the same way. And the board will listen to you because uh, you are equal. Uh, in, the, in this other kind of discussion which is going on, on on a governmental level, and I can speak on that because for 10 years I was chairing the Bulgarian President's IT Advisory Committee, and I could see the difference, not any longer since last year, but I could see that, uh, oh, two years ago, um, the difference when you go and say, I'm, you know, here's my president.bg card and here is my, let's say, Internet Society card, and they say, oh, then you can speak here or you can not speak here. So I think the really important thing is that people don't see that far away. You mentioned the, the an organization which is not engaged or could be engaged, but there are so many organizations that don't understand they should be engaged in this dialogue because they don't see beyond the next quarter, like in a way, or the next year. I mean, nobody, long-term thinking in our kind of Western world is basically one, two years. If you start thinking about five years, ten years, it's people say, I don't know who's going to be there. I, I don't think that's a reasonable response, Fanny. I mean, th this, the organization which you and I both know invests in human rights issues that have 20 or 30 year well, frameworks on them. I, the, the question I'm really asking is, is where where would you start? And and, and what you've said would, is it's great that anyone can speak to ICANN. I, I would start I would start actually um, by engaging nationally. Like I would ask anyone who is from any country to go back to that country, find the uh, um, the organizations or the individuals. In some countries, you don't need to have an organization. Individuals who are kind of enthusiastic about it and who want to be part of this dialogue and say, look, let's go and talk to our parliament. Uh, expert in the telecommunications committee which are dealing with the legislation that is defining the future of the internet. So let's go and talk to the people who represent our country at the ITU and try to explain to them what's the importance about, for example, um, such a proposal that I called it a little while ago about building new internet, whether it's actually achievable, whether that means spending tens of billions of local currency for something that may never happen. I think also important is that um, and I, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I have to take off my ICANN hat for a moment because I've been a, an advocate for such things in Bulgaria for many years. Um, many times people don't believe that somebody would listen to them. They say, ah, what's the point in going and talking to a government if they're not going to, who am I? The reality is that um, governments have changed. The, the, latest, the last few years show that especially in Eastern Europe, but also in other places of the world. Governments try to listen to people before it's too late. And the Internet has, in a way, facilitated this dialogue. Whether you may argue, you know, what the, res the final result of this was, like people quote, you know, the Arab Spring or whatever, but there are many other places where people who got together online for quick uh, action or quick decision-making uh, they could achieve a change in a governmental policy very quickly. In Bulgaria, there was a situation last year, on June, I think, 14th. Uh, the government took a decision to appoint a head of the Bulgarian National Security Agency. That same afternoon, people went out, 
the next day he resigned. I mean, this could have not been achieved without the internet. So I think that, and I don't say that necessarily it should be a pressure for that, but also if we don't understand the importance of the internet, keeping the internet free and open and built really bottom up in a bottom up process, then in a few years we may end up in an internet which is built on a top down process in which people will not be able to share what they think. And in certain countries, in certain cultures, I would say, even not countries, and I, I may give some delicate examples here, so ex you know, excuse me if, if, it's, if it sounds wrong, but um, in certain countries, oh, I can give an example with Bulgaria because that's more safe for me. Um, if there is a, there is a, there is a certain attitude towards gay people. So if I'm, if I'm a, an activist, and I actually have signed letters supporting gay activists in Bulgaria when they were fighting for their rights, uh, that's kind of dangerous. You know, there was a guy, a young guy, who was killed in the park downtown Sofia because, and I quote, he looked like a gay. That's his, his, the two guys who beat him to death said. So it's, it's, if, if you're searching online and suddenly the, what you're searching online comes through some kind of a governmental news system, you know, you may be actually exposed to serious issues. So I think there are many, many ways where you may start doing something today and the outcome of what you're doing today may be in a few years, but you may not understand it. So I would encourage everyone to really engage into... Um, get involving in this dialogue about the governance of the internet n locally. So let, let's take some other questions, Tim. Yeah, so I guess I'm less hopeful about the chance for people <coughs> to get engaged. You, you mentioned remote participation at ICANN. I've been very involved in remote participation at the IGF. We're many years into these structures, and remote participation is still not equal participation. It's still much harder to engage and the people who can fly there uh, do get a stronger voice and it, it feels that we've shifted from early internet governance structures where there was a better balance between government, private sector and civil society to this structure now meaning civil society simply can't afford to, to get involved, to keep track, to be sustained. The, the governance mailing lists are a few actors now, a few people who've got the time and resource to follow everything that's going on and we've not taken advantage of the internet of transcripts of text to to build new ways of doing governing and, and, and new ways of making governance possible to follow in this complex environment. And I'm just wondering if you see we're heading in good directions with making this place more legible, more easy to understand, more possible to say, I'm interested in this issue, where do I fit? Or is it just becoming more and more confusing? Well, no, I don't think it's becoming more... Con I mean, the, 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 I don't think it's becoming more confusing participating. And you're right, in, in the Internet Governance Forum and in other forums, you. You participate, you watch, but it's kind of a one-way communication. You can ask a question or two, but you cannot be a substantive part of the dialogue unless you have somebody there. However, I mean, ICANN is a good example because every time we meet, we meet on a different continent, so we basically go around the world to be closer to people. But the, and the Brazil meeting, which is forming as we speak, there was just uh, yesterday, actually, they published the minutes from the, from the last meeting of the uh, committee that's fine-tuning the meeting, and they said uh, that there is a broad view about the need, and I quote, the need of continue, to, of continue evolving the multi-stakeholder internet governance ecosystem to energize discussion and to achieve greater consensus of the community, including a broader range of stakeholders, and provide possible means to develop responses to specific problems faced by government slash stakeholders. So people really understand that there are certain constraints and you cannot engage everyone. But we do try. The role of organization that can support participation um, in debates that are taking place around the world is important. Uh, that's why ICANN is trying to bring people from developing countries. Also important is that um, we, and it's a whole new culture, it's, we need to build somehow the to make the people believe that actually their opinion is important for us. And for us, I don't mean for ICANN per se or just for the, you know, the global internet ecosystem, but it's important for the people who 
uh, are defining how the internet is developing. Because if we don't have people, I mean, the thing is, this, it's very easy. I can take decisions every time, every month almost, you know, on certain issues, like new generic top level domains, whatever. If you're not part of this dialogue, how to frame this, these decisions are still going to be taken. We just are not going to hear your voice. So we really need to hear voices from around the world. Otherwise, these decisions may not be the necessarily taking into consideration all the cultural aspects of all the, um, the traditional aspects of countries from, or cultures from around the world. So really, I mean, any, I think I, it's not a panacea, it's not a painkiller that can solve all the problems, but indeed participation is crucial. Bruce? So what, what do we make of the status of the attempts at, at internet balkanization? Whether it's uh, Brazil's talking about a nationalization, Germany, Great Firewall of China. A lot of this is post Snowden. I mean, do we have to worry about national borders? On well, the, the, and, the, and where are they going to come from? The term internet balkanization actually was used many years ago, and um, it's on the it's on the public records of one of the ICANN minutes and I said that uh, and using your presence here, I said that I can agree with this term if we are talking about the music of Goran Bregovic, a famous Balkan composer who steals music from everywhere and mixes it and makes gypsy, it really gypsy music. gypsy music, right. So I was, uh, I don't like the term balkanization in the terms of, you know, separation and division because I think it's not right. The reality is that um, uh, this this term doesn't came didn't come after Snowden. It was there before that, and people still believe that there is balkanization of the internet. But there are different um, uh, different cultures, and in some cultures you cannot really. The worst possible thing is to try to infuse somehow a model and say this is the way it should be, and that's why it should be around the world like that. It's much better to to ask people and to say tell us how is in your part of the world. And I don't, I, I don't want to name countries because I think, I mean, first of all, who am I to name countries? But secondly, there are different cultures even within a single country. I mean, if you take as an example, it, there are almost no countries where you can say this is one unified nation, no other nations, you know, it's like, this is it. So to hear all this kind of broader, um, it's actually beauty. It's not bad to have all these voices coming together. I don't see this as a balkanization in the sense of your thing. Sure. But just to take that question a bit further, if the voices decide that they don't want to come together and kind of have this global discussion anymore, but rather decide to fragment, use a different word, and kind of set their own terms for their own internets and have kind of the international restrictions that we are now facing, whether they existed before or after, how do you think well, that we the, should be dealing with the that. The question is about whether there might be some international, I'm repeating it on the mic, for, inter, for, inter, uh, for some international restrictions, but I think that's also part of the dangers confronting the internet. That's part of the dialogue where we are engaging with the ITU to make sure that the ITU does not make their own agenda to have some control functions over the internet, to, uh, which, by the way, if you, uh, three years ago was uh, revealed without revelations, without leaking, just by reading the, uh, the Russian government website where there are transcripts of the conversations between Mr. Putin and the Secretary General of the ITU, where in their dialogue, which was transcribed there, they discussed um, an idea by the ITU how to increase the oversight functions of the ITU over the Internet. So I think... We, First of all, we should not be afraid that somebody will say, no, I don't want to be part of it. That's fine. You know, you cannot force. You, by force, you can never give anything to anyone. You can only take. We're, we don't want to, we cannot force. And I don't think anyone wants to force something. I mean, we have seen, in, at least in my country's history, when forcefully they were trying to give us communism. <laughs> we see what happened in the end, you know. It was introduced to Bulgaria. It didn't did not originate from Bulgaria. So I think we, are, we have to be really cool and take it easy on people or countries or organizations that come and say, no, we want our own thing. Fine. It's okay. 
you know, if, if you want it, if you can build it, if your users, are, if your people are using it. I still believe that sharing information is around the world is some kind of a forceful, very forceful thing. So it could be hardly avoided. So, so if, <clears throat> if Brazil and China both build their own rival DNS systems that are not interconnected with ICANN, they're run by different authorities, they have different root servers, your opinion as a, as a long-time ICANN member and a, and a current ICANN staffer is that that's fine? Well, no, my opinion is that we, ICANN as an organization cannot prevent that from happening. And neither, sh why, I mean, it's, if, if, so here's the thing, national internet has always been prerogative, has always been within the uh, control of the nation. When the Bulgarian government introduced licenses over the internet service providers, eventually they would have made their own internet if we have allowed that. Because that's very easy to do. When you have licenses, you can just say, well, our license requires that you do not use mm -hmm. this DNS and we'll give you IP addresses or for better control. Better qu they were saying that it's actually for better quality. That was the reason for the licenses. But I think really, um, each country decides this separately. Now, when you put together the balance, do you want to be part of the global uh, world commerce? Do you want your products to be sold online around the world, or do you want them to be sold within the country? Some country may say, I want, my, you know, I want this particular product to be sold only here. You can still do it even within the current internet. Other questions, please. Being discussed um, a lot now, right now, this, which is quite different from balkanization, is internationalization oh, or yes. globalization of ICANN. Yes. And I think it highly relates to the Brazil meeting. Yeah. And I just want so to hear your the question. On that. The question is about the term internationalization of ICANN, and I love this term because, um, as I, I mentioned earlier, ICANN is indeed an international organization by its staff members, by its board composition, by the hub offices that it has built in Los Angeles, Istanbul, and Singapore, and engagement offices in Brussels, Geneva, Montevideo, Beijing. Maybe I'm missing already uh, one or two. Uh, now, certain governments, they'll say, well, but you are not an international organization as the ITU or the Red Cross or others. Yes, we are not, but it's historical. I can most found it in California because not only the internet was created in the US, but also John Postel, who was supposed to be the first ICANN chief technical officer, was in Marina del Rey. Uh, and um, he was actually, before ICANN was created, he was the Ayana Tsar, so to speak. <laughs> he was dealing with all this IP address allocation and country code domain name uh, alloc uh, no, uh, management issues. But um, could ICANN develop further? I'm sure it can. Is ICANN changing? Yes. I mean, the board is discussing, and the, the other thing is the board is actually discussing. I can is not changing because I can, as a staff, you know, or as, as a non, as a as a legal body, wants to change. Because I can is built on supporting organizations where anyone can participate. I can changes its bylaws and based on input from the community. So if. It's a very unique model, by the way. I, I was not familiar with another model of this type before I, can, yeah. before I started working with ICANN. Because it sounds really awkward. And in many cases, when I was with my governmental hat before I joined ICANN board, I was like wondering also, how is it working? You know, how is it possible? It's possible. It's an experiment in the making. But it's a very, very good experiment because here is, you, you mentioned the Brazil meeting also. This is an example. If, if ICANN was not this type of organization, it probably would have not, it, it would have not ended up with a high level meeting in Brazil and being discussed around the world. It would have been one of the usual organizations which everybody knows what it is and we have more rights, like governments have more rights and actually even within ICANN there is a dialogue um, and people say, well, why are the governments equal to the others, you know? Please. Um, just follow, follow on that question. <clears throat> You, uh, I mean, young ITU, there are a lot of industry consortia and forums that are engaged in standards related to the um, internet. Um, for instance, like IETF, they, they 
do a lot of things in, in this regard. The I, IETF or the ICANN be open to anyone who's interested in their work. But have you ever been aware that the government really like send somebody or some government officials engage in this like button up internet government governance structure? Well, first of all, I said earlier there are more than 130 governments which are members of the Governmental Advisory Committee of ICANN. They sent people to participate at ICANN meetings. As far as I know, because this is their own, they have their own mailing list, they have support and stuff like that. They discuss issues which are relevant to the government. They issue, the structure is so that they issue advice to the board, but the board cannot just turn away the advice. They have, if they actually vote against an advice, they have to give a very good reasoning for that. And um, the board is usually very careful in listening to the GAC, the Governmental Advisory Committee. Also, the GAC chair sits on the board. So she is now in, Ch I mean, she's in, or he or she, right now it's a, it's a lady from <coughs> Canada. They're all informed about what, what all the discussions that are taking at the board level. And that's how you keep the government informed. Also, Many governments are actually happy with this model and they contribute and they want to contribute to the development of this model. Even governments who publicly may say, we don't understand why ICANN is dealing with those issues, even they are active members of the ICANN Governmental Advisory Committee. And I, I'm particularly careful with making sure that we don't mix attitude of governments towards the U.S. foreign policy with attitude of governments towards what ICANN does. In some cases, they may use it as an excuse, but in many cases, they're actually, they understand it's very different. And there is also a perception, of course, that ICANN is controlled by the U.S. government, which to me is the most amazing uh, story because uh, I haven't seen uh, any attempt by the U.S. government to control what ICANN does. And even in situations where you may argue, but couldn't the U.S. government have done something? They don't. Because it's also, ICANN is so public, there is no way for having some hidden agenda, you know, which it will, it will be so clear that there is no way to do it. So um, I think we have time for a final question. Please. Um, Indira Adrish, I'm Director of Information Security Office here at School of Engineering at the Applied Sciences at Harvard. I have Yona Palkivano. Yeah, I'm from Balkan, of course, from Bosnia. Yeah. That's the reason I know Bregovic. Anyway, the question is, uh, by moving from IPv4, when we use network address translation, uh, and now moving to IPv6, that people expect to use more routable IP addresses, the security will be and privacy will be significantly affected. Uh, do you have any working group or your global approach toward uh, information security, the uh, problems introduced by IPv6? Yeah, there is. A, I will put you in touch. There, the question was about uh, security on IPv6, and I will I will ask actually again. I will put uh, a link on the website uh, and put you in touch with the people at ICANN who are dealing with that because. We have a whole department which is dealing with security, stability, and resiliency of the internet, and uh, it's a, it's a whole other area where, again, and sometimes I say that ICANN is like the phone company. Like, how many of you? I'm sure nobody, but it's just a funny question. How many of you ever call the phone company to say, "Hey, my phone is working today"? <laughs> nobody does, right? So people don't know that I can exists because ICANN is actually doing its job. And I think as long as we try to, I mean, a few years ago, just to give you an idea, and I think that goes into what you asked me. A few years ago, um, there was an attack on the root servers many years ago, 10 years ago. And they put down about 60% of the root servers that manage all the domain names. And um, it was after that that we, that the technical community realized that actually that's an, you know, there needs to be root servers around the world. And now there are hundreds of root servers. There were 13 back then. Now there are hundreds in probably every country. I mean, there are several in Bulgaria, many, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. There is one in Serbia for sure. I know, I don't know about Bosnia, but there was really, and that means that if there is an attack on root servers today, 
it cannot succeed because the speed at which the root server's copies are spread around the world is so fast, and ICANN is part of this effort, but not the only organization that's dealing it, with it, that it surpasses the uh, attempts of bad guys to put them down. And I think that's the way to deal with it. You, you deal with threats by addressing them. You don't de deal with threats by avoiding them, or saying, oh, this is not going to happen to me. If you start thinking this way, then it's definitely going to happen. Well, let's wrap it up there. Um, thanks very much, Renny. Thanks for coming. Thank thanks, everybody, for questions. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'll have the, uh, the talk online soon and uh, look around for uh, notes that I know that Nathan and others are publishing. And um, You'll be hanging around for a little bit? Yes, I'm here for another hour or so, so any questions?